My name is Rick Renner and I'm seated in the cliffs just above the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And in the distance, I can see the Sea of Galilee. But during the time of Jesus, the sea was a lot fuller and it came right up to the base of this cliff. And Mark chapter five tells us one day, Jesus' ship arrived here at this side of the lake. And when Jesus arrived, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Where I am sitting are the ruins of a chapel that was constructed in the fifth century to commemorate where the demoniac lived in these cliffs. It's quite a story, one of the greatest miracles Jesus ever performed. But when you read Mark chapter five, it tells us very important details about the demoniac. For example, verse four tells us they couldn't bind him with fetters or chains. Verse four also tells us no man could tame him. That word tame, the Greek word demazo, is the same word used to describe wild animal tamers. Those who could tame the most ferocious of beasts were unable to tame this man. But listen to what the next verse says. And always night and day, he was in the mountains, that's where we are, he was in the cliffs, and in the tombs, that's where we are. And what was he doing? Crying and cutting himself with stones. Well, this whole area is covered with sharp stones. Why was he crying? Well, we could speculate that he was crying because he wanted to be free. He might have been crying because he was so demonically tormented. He was cutting himself with stones, an act of self-destruction. That's because the devil's aim is to drive people to the point of total self-destruction. That's what Jesus said in John 10:10. the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This man was on the brink of annihilation when Jesus showed up and Jesus changed everything. If you know someone that's on the edge of destruction, or if you feel that you have lost hope, I wanna tell you Jesus can change everything because Jesus has power over every situation. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. This is Rick Renner, and I want to say thank you for letting me come right into your space today. And if you have a prayer need, let us know how to pray for you. We would just love to hear from you and put our faith together with yours for whatever you're facing or for whatever you're believing for right now. That is such a privilege to pray with you. So we're always here for you. Either call us, send us an email, send us a letter. We're waiting to hear from you right now. And I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series right now called what the New Testament tells us about demons. Wow. The New Testament tells us so much about demons, and we need to know what the New Testament says. And this series is so powerful. It's based on these programs, and you will just love it. We're also offering you my book right now, which is called Dress to Kill, A Biblical Approach to Spiritual Warfare and Armor. It's about 500 pages primarily based on spiritual weaponry, which is found in Ephesians chapter six. It is a remarkable book and it comes with pictures. Everybody likes pictures. Wow, the pictures are just fabulous and they really help you understand what Roman weaponry looked like and what Paul was describing in Ephesians chapter six. Many people call this a Christian classic. Millions of people have read it and I want to encourage you to order your copy today. Today I want to talk to you about what the Bible teaches us about demons. And our text today is primarily going to be based on Matthew chapter 8 and Mark chapter 5. Now when you read the four Gospels, you find there are three Gospels that are very similar. These are called the Synoptic Gospels. Those are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These three Gospels basically tell the same stories, but each of them tell it from their own perspective. For example, we have Mark's perspective, then we have Matthew's perspective, and we have Luke's. And Luke's is always very interesting to me because Luke is a doctor and Luke often uses medical terms when he describes miraculous events. But today, we're primarily going to be focusing on Mark chapter 5, then we're going to jump over to Matthew chapter 8. And today specifically, we're going to be looking at, are you ready for this? Demonic terror, demonic destruction, and demonic strength. And you're going to see that Jesus 
has authority over all of it. And in fact, Jesus has given that authority to you. We know that because of what the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, where Jesus says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. This is our foundational verse for this series. When Jesus says, Behold, I give you power, the Greek word is exousias, it's really the word authority. Jesus says, I'm giving you authority, which means when you deal with demonic powers, you're not acting in your own authority. You're acting in Christ-given authority. Jesus said, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. That word tread, the Greek word pitea, which means to walk, to trample, even to crush. It describes the forward movement of feet, putting your feet on something. And Jesus in this verse says, you will tread on serpents and scorpions, which means if the devil tries to get in your way, don't stop, don't back up, just keep going forward, move your feet and trample him along the way. Jesus has given you the authority to do that. And then he goes on to say, and over all the power of the enemy. That word over in Greek is the word epi, the word epi means upon, but in this particular case, it describes a position of advantage or one who has a position of superiority, which means in Christ, you have a position of advantage over all the power of the enemy. The word power is the word dunamis, the same Greek word which described the advancing armies of Roman soldiers, all of their might, all of their muster, it was the equivalent of saying, even if the devil sends his best against you, you have an advantage over him because of the authority that you have been given in Jesus Christ. You have authority over all the works of the enemy. So remember that today as we begin to study the subject of demonic terror, demonic destruction, and demonic strength. You have authority over all of it just like Jesus did. And we're going to find that today beginning in Mark chapter 5. So let's go there. Mark chapter 5 and verse 1 says, And they came over into the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. That's where I was, where I was standing in the beginning of today's program. I was standing in the cliffs right above the Sea of Galilee on the eastern side of the sea in the country of the Gadarenes. That is exactly where this event took place. Listen to verse 2. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Let's take these verses slowly. I want to make sure you really get everything that is in these verses. You may know someone that is tormented by demons, someone that is demonized. Well, what can we learn from these verses that will be a help to you? That's what I want us to see today. Look again at verse 2. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him. The word immediately is a Greek word, which means without delay, without pause, instantaneously, there met him. The word met is a Greek word which was used militarily to describe a hostile meeting. So this demon-possessed man immediately barged out of the tombs. That's what the Bible tells us in verse 2. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, without pause, without delay, militarily, there confronted him. In fact, the word met can mean face-to-face. -face. It was a face-to-face -face encounter. This was a hostile encounter. These demons were coming out to challenge Jesus, just like they challenged everyone who passed by that way. And now they came to challenge Jesus. There met him out of the tombs. The word out is the Greek word ek. It's where we get the word exit. They literally exited right out of the tombs. And when the Bible says tombs, it's a Greek word menema, which means graves, tombs or tombstones. This man was literally living among the tombs. And the verse says it was a man with an unclean spirit. You know what the Greek says? The Greek says a man in the grip of an unclean spirit or a man in the control of an unclean spirit, which means this man did not have a demon. The demon had him. He was literally in the grip of this spirit. He was in the control of of this spirit. And the Bible calls it an unclean spirit. In fact, that's the word that Jesus always used to describe evil spirits. He always called them unclean. He describes something low level, foul, dirty, vile, nasty. This is Jesus' description of evil spirits. And in fact, they're so vile, 
They're so low level, they're so nasty, you're going to find later in these programs, they were willing to even live in low level, dirty, nasty pigs. Evil spirits are foul. And the Bible tells us in verse 3, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. There is so much in verse 3. First of all, it says he had his dwelling among the tombs. Now, this man had not always lived among tombs. In fact, you're going to find in two programs from now that he used to have a house. And when Jesus gave his life back to him, he went back to his house. But now he's left his house. He's so tormented. He's so demonized that now he's living or dwelling among the tombs. The Greek word for dwelling means he's taken up residence. This is really where he is living. And the Bible says his dwelling was among the word among in Greek is the word in, which means he was literally located right in the midst of the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. When the Bible says no man, in Greek it is the word udes, it means no one, no, not a single one. It tells us many had attempted to bind him, and no one, no, not a single person was able to bind him, no, not with chains. Oh, this verse is so loaded. In fact, the rest of the verse says, no man could bind him. The word could is the Greek word, which means to be able to muster strength or muster power. It literally means no one was able, not one single man was able to muster enough strength to bind this man. The word bind is the Greek word deo, which means to put in chains, to put in bonds. It's even the same Greek word, which means to incarcerate. They had tried to put this man in bonds and chains. They had tried to incarcerate this man, but no one, not a single person, was able to bind him. And then notice the King James Version says, no, not, with chains. No, not, in Greek, is the word ukete, which means they had tried to do this on multiple occasions, but they were unsuccessful even to bind him with, the verse says, chains. This word chains is the Greek word halusis, which describes chains or handcuffs for the hands or wrists. So they put this man in handcuffs, but they could not keep him in handcuffs. Look at verse 4. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains. When the Bible says often bound, the word often literally means recurrently, frequently. They had attempted to do this on many occasions. They had frequently bound him, that word bound, again, the Greek word deo, put him in chains, put him in bonds. They had tried to incarcerate him on multiple occasions, for he'd been often bound with fetters and chains. Well, we already saw the word chains describes handcuffs or chains around the hands or the wrists. Then what are fetters? Well, the word fetters is the Greek word pedes, comes from the word podas, which is the word for feet. These are chains around the feet. Now, it's interesting, if you really look at the words that are used, the word for chains or handcuffs doesn't describe chains like we think of, but rather it was like a solid piece of metal that was wrapped around both arms. I want you to see this picture. This will make sense to you in just a moment. A solid piece of metal which are wrapped around both arms. Now, just imagine if your arms were together like this and there was a piece of metal bonded together around both arms, it would be very hard for you to use your hands or to exert any strength because of the position of your hands. When the Bible talks about fetters, it's talking about very heavy fetters on both of these feet. These were very strong impediments. And this man many times has had his hands wrapped in metal, his legs have been wrapped in chains. The Bible says often. So they've attempted this on many occasions. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Verse 4, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder. Again, chains describes the single piece of metal wrapped around both arms or both wrists. And the Bible says he plucked them asunder. You know what the Greek means? The Greek word literally means he was able to rip it in half or he could tear it off of his hands. How much strength would you need to have to rip metal to shreds? That's how much demonic energy this man had. Though they wrapped him and thought he was secure, when he was energized by the demon spirits, he had the ability literally to rip in half the metal that was on his arms. And what about the fetters on the feet? Well, the Bible tells us. The Bible says the fetters on the feet 
were broken in pieces. Broken in pieces is the Greek word suntribo. The word suntribo is a well-known Greek word. It's used to describe the crushing of grapes when you make wine or the crushing of bones to reduce something to dust. Now we find this demoniac is so energized by demon spirits, he can rip metal in half off of his hands and the chains that are on his feet, he begins banging his legs together and grinding his ankles together, grinding the metal together ferociously, demonically, with such fierceness that he is able to reduce the metal to dust until finally his feet are free. This is just amazing what this verse tells us about the demoniac of Gadara. And the verse goes on to say, neither could any man tame him. Wow. That's very insightful because the word tame is the Greek word damadzo. <laughs> Anyone who knows Greek knows the word damadzo. The word damadzo described wild animal tamers, those who were able to tame the most ferocious of beasts from nature, lions, tigers, and bears. They were unable to deal with this man. In fact, the word demazo, I want to read to you directly from my notes, is a word that means to domesticate. That means no one could domesticate this man. It means to subdue. No one could subdue him or to bring under control. So no one could domesticate this man. No one could subdue this man. No one could bring this man under control. This word tame, the Greek word demazo, was used to describe animal trainers who were experts at capturing and domesticating the wildest and most ferocious of beasts, such as lions, tigers, and bears. Normally, these animals would maul and kill a person, but skilled trainers were able to take the wildest beasts and domesticate them. So now we find people who are experts at incarcerating criminals and binding people that were dangerous had tried to bind this man. They could not. They put chains on his hand. He ripped them in half. They put chains on his feet. He reduced them to dust. They brought in wild animal tamers to see what they could do with this man. And those who were experts at taming the most ferocious of beasts walked away from this man and said, there's nothing we can do to domesticate this man. He is beyond our control. That was the situation of the demoniac in Gadara. You may personally know someone and you wonder, can anyone help them? You've tried medication, you've tried counseling, you've tried everything. Maybe you feel like they felt they're impossible to control. Their situation is out of control. But I want to say Jesus can help anybody, just like he helped the demoniac of Gadara. But look what else the Bible tells us in Mark 5, verse 5. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Always night and day in Greek is one phrase. It means perpetually when it was daytime, when it was nighttime, when it was dark, when it was light. It didn't matter what time of the day. This man was perpetually tormented. And look what he was doing. Always night and day, he was in the mountains, in those cliffs right above the Sea of Galilee, and in those tombs, crying. Oh, this word crying is a Greek word, kradzo. It means to yell. It describes an agonizing scream. This man is in anguish. And not only is he crying, the verse says he's cutting himself with stones. The Greek word katakopto, it means to mutilate or to gash. Or this man is trying to commit suicide. Demon spirits have suicidal tendencies. And now this man, look at it, he's living among the tombs. We read that in verse 2. We read it again in verse 3. In Greek it uses the word in, which means he's literally situated in the region of death. He's living near tombs. This man is really closer to death than he is to life. And he's not living much of an existence. You're going to read later as we get into the next program. The Dr. Luke tells us he was naked. He was completely naked. He was driven of the devil. This was a man who was miserably tormented. And now living among the tombs, he is crying out, the Greek word kradzo, an agonizing scream. This man is truly in torture. And he's cutting himself, katakopto. He's mutilating himself. He's gashing himself with stones, trying to commit suicide. Some scholars speculate 
that the man might have been trying to liberate himself of demon spirits. Well, think about it. Obviously, religious people were not able to help him. Those who were incarcerated prisoners were not able to help him. Those who tamed the wildest of animals were not able to tame him. He may have thought his only hope of freedom was to die. But what I want you to know is the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And the devil was driving this man to the point of self-destruction. This was a very terrible situation. But when you come to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, Matthew tells us another piece of the story. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. Well, first of all, Matthew tells us there were two. Mark says there was one. So is there a conflict? No, there's no conflict. Mark always deals with the most severe of all cases. There were two, but Mark focused on the one. Matthew gives us the whole story. There were actually two. And Matthew tells us they came out of the tombs. The Greek word ek again is used. They made an exit right out of the tombs to confront Jesus. And interesting that Matthew always also uses this word, they met Jesus, the word met, which describes a hostile conflict. They came out to confront Jesus, just like they confronted everybody that passed by that way. And the Bible says they were exceedingly fierce. Hmm. Exceedingly fierce is the Greek word kalipos, and listen to what it means. It describes danger, risk, or hurt something that is wounding. So these were wounding men. If you got near them, you were placing yourself in jeopardy. It was used in various pieces of literature to depict wild, vicious, uncontrollable animals that were unpredictable and dangerous or a deadly menace. It could denote anything that was treacherous or potentially harmful. It gives the idea of an action, place, person, or thing that is harsh, harmful, and filled with high risk. So when the Bible says they came out of the tomb and they were exceedingly fierce, it means these men created a very high danger situation for anybody passing by that way. And that's why the verse goes on to say that no one wanted to pass by that way. The word way is the Greek word hodas. It's really the word for a road. And there was a major road that passed along the Sea of Galilee. And when people would pass on that road, these demon-possessed men would barge out of the tombs to terrorize them just like they tried to do to Jesus. But they had no effect on Jesus because Jesus has authority over demons and Jesus accepted the challenge and he cast the demons out of these men. You have authority over demons as well. We know that because in Luke 10 verse 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give to you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the work of the enemy. You have authority over demons. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment and I'm going to pray for you. There is a spiritual realm where forces of light and dark battle for control. In Rick Renner's series, What the New Testament Tells Us About Demons, Rick explains how your spiritual authority trumps demonic power. But there is never a reason to be afraid because you have been given spiritual authority. In this powerful sermon series, you will discover what the Bible teaches about spiritual authority and demonic activity that God has given you authority to overcome. Available in digital or physical formats starting at just $10. In addition to this teaching series, you can also receive the book, Dress to Kill. Dress to Kill reveals how the ancient Roman soldier's armor uniquely represents the way we should prepare for spiritual battles today. This beautifully bound 500 page book is the definitive Bible study available on spiritual warfare and is available for just $22. Don't miss this special offer. What the New Testament tells us about demons and or the companion book, Dress to Kill. Call now or go to renner.org to order. My name is Joel Renner coming to you right from Moscow, Russia. And I want to say thank you to all of our ministry partners. It's because of your support that we can help people fighting addictions get their families and their lives back. All around the world, there is a huge drug crisis. Maybe you know someone who has suffered or is suffering from alcohol and drug addictions. The cycle of addiction is a terrible thing. Because of the generous support of our partners, we have been able to join with several Christian rehab centers where men and women 
can be trained to reintegrate into the workplace, receive the medical help they need, and have a support system in place so they're not isolated and alone. Because of your generous support, we have seen people with hepatitis C get well, many who lost their family relationships get back together, and many others who were on heroin, cocaine, and other drugs receive freedom and become complete people again. This has been made possible with partners who support our work. Your gift makes this kind of a difference. These people need your help. Please call or go online to randy.org to give a gift of any size. Because of your support, we are able to make a huge difference in people's lives. In Luke 10, verse 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Jesus was so excited about what he was telling his disciples that he said, Behold. In Greek, it means, Wow, look at what I'm about to tell you. I'm about to give you something remarkable. Behold, I give you power. The Greek word says exousias. I give you authority over serpents, over scorpions, over anything that gets in your way and over all the power of the enemy. That word over, the Greek word epi, it describes a position of advantage or a position of superiority. That's what you have right now because Jesus gave you authority. If you are in Christ, then you are in Him who is the head of all principality and power. And when you speak, Jesus speaks and demons recognize your voice as the voice of Jesus himself. So use your voice, use your authority. Jesus said he gave you authority over all the power of the enemy. And I rebuke the power of the enemy in your life in Jesus' name. I stand with you for your family to be set free, for the peace of God to fill your home and for strife to leave your home. In the name of Jesus, amen. By the way, I'm offering you my series right now, which is called What the New Testament Tells Us About Demons. The subtitle says, How to Recognize Demonic Activity and How to Exercise Your God-Given Authority Over Demons. Also offering you my book. Oh, I want you to have this book called Dress to Kill, A Biblical Approach to Spiritual Warfare and Armor. The full title says, You Don't Have to Take It Anymore because you're dressed to kill. Wow. We're out of time, but it's been so good to be with you today. We're coming back tomorrow. And tomorrow, we're going to be looking at demonic ferociousness, demonic self-destruction, and demonic fits, and what we can do to stop it all. It's going to be good. I'll see you tomorrow. But remember, Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. See you in the next program. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.